Good morning. Really glad you're here. We have a great, great day planned, and uh, you're going to love worshiping with us this, this morning. I always forget, David tells me in between services, to ask you to fill out that attendance um, part of your bulletin. It's, it's perforated, and if you tear that off, um, you can... Uh, if you put the information on there, you can also put uh, prayer requests or or uh, things like that. And we do look at them. Uh, we, we look at every one of them every week. So if you would do that and just put them in the basket, uh, you know, wrap them around uh, your thousand dollar check and put them in that uh, put them in that basket. OK, um, I got several things, but I'm going to save some of them till the end. I, I did get a call from. Uh, the, uh, uh, Dan Larson, who is kind of runs uh, Pine Haven uh, Christian Children's Ranch in Montana, and we support them, or you support them through your giving. It's part of our missions uh, program here, and th- it's the best run children's program I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and uh, so we've supported them for a long time. Connie and I've supported them for a long, long time, but New Life has supported them. And uh, he just sent me a note and thanked uh, you and the people. He said that the, the New Life and people associated with New Life uh, gave to uh, Pine Haven uh, uh, about $25,000 uh, last year. And that, that's really good. Now, that, most of that, is uh, is from other sources. I don't know for sure. I think we New Life actually gave between maybe five and seven thousand dollars. So the rest of it was individual gifts. So he wanted me to make sure I thank you, and so consider yourselves thanked. And uh, um, it, it, they'll probably be here one day in the future. They have a tendency to leave the cold of Montana and come to Florida in the winter time and uh, and try to tell us it's their ministry, you know. <laughs> so we're suspicious of them right off. Let me pray and then we'll uh, begin. Father, thank you for this time together this morning, and we just pray that as we offer up our our praise and our adoration, that you will receive it, that it will bring honor and glory to you and to Jesus. And I ask this in his name. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Good morning and welcome. Isn't it great getting together as his body on Sunday mornings? We look so forward to this time and thank you so much for for sharing it with us. Revelations chapter 4 describes the scenes of heaven and the throne and what's around it and who's around it. Excuse me. In verse 8, it talks of the four living creatures with six wings, eyes all around them, day and night without ceasing. They're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. First song we're going to do this morning is taken from that verse. So let's stand and sing to God how holy he is. Oh 
revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. May you see it.
Thank you, Pam. <clears throat> Search me and lead me. That's a request we all ought to be making to God. Let's stand and continue our time of worship with In Christ Alone.
Lord God, we thank you for that cross, what it means for our salvation, what you did to provide that salvation. Lord, as we take of this bread and this juice, we remember that awful day, but then that great day when you rose. Lord, thank you for that precious gift. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Cheryl. Takes a lot to get ready. That's, uh... Well, today I want to begin a kind of a short series of messages um, concerning the, the New Testament church. Testament church. Now, we use the church in a lot of different ways, don't we? Sometimes um, the way we use it identifies a building. Like, um, I'm going to park my car over by the church. Uh, sometimes it identifies an activity. I've heard people say, you know, we got together and we just had church. Uh, sometimes it identifies a denomination or a group of people. You, we might say that church holds strictly to the teachings of the Bible. Or sometimes it identifies a local congregation. Uh, I belong to New Life Christian Church. 
And sometimes it identifies all Christians. The church is made up of Christians from all of the world. There's probably others. But are any of those the way the, the Bible identifies the New, Test, or the New Testament church? Or is one of those how the Bible uh, explains the concept uh, of God's church? Here, here's what I believe. I believe that uh, when we don't know what the church is or what the church is intended to do, it's so easy to lose our way. Um, so where do we go to learn about the church? Well, we go to the Bible, and specifically or especially uh, the New Testament. The first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They tell the story of Jesus. But beginning with the book of Acts, it's about the church. The first half of the book of Acts tells about the beginning of the church. The last half of the book of Acts tells about the spread of Christianity in the, and the church. And then you come to all those letters, some written by Paul, some written by others. But all of those letters tell us how Christians are to function within the church. And then you get to the book of Revelation, and it tells us what will ultimately happen to the church. What the church looks like in the New Testament is what the church is supposed to look like now. What we, see in the, what we see of the church in the New Testament is the norm. So uh, I, today, I want to talk about the beginning of the church. And so I've already said that comes from the first half of the, uh, of the book of Acts. Now, we don't obviously have time to read very much of that, but maybe, uh, maybe you will take time to read it uh, sometime um, either today or, or this week. There's three main, main points that I want to make. There, oh, there's an outline in your bulletin. Uh, there's three main points. Let me give them to you, and then we'll go back and look at them. First of all, uh, the beginning of the church was expected. Secondly, the beginning of the church was identifiable. And the third point is the beginning of the church was methodical. So let's talk about the beginning of the church being expected. So is the church seen uh, in, the, in the Old Testament? Well, there is a, a popular theology today that says the church is not seen in the uh, Old Testament because God never in, originally intended to have a church. The thought goes something like this. When Jesus came the first time, uh, he came to establish his kingdom. But because of the unbelief of the Jews, he, he couldn't get it done. And so he decided that he would leave and at some point in the future, come back and, and try again. Only this time, uh, he would use force if necessary. And so he had to have some kind of plan of what to do with followers of God in between that failing of the first time and his success in the second time. And so he thought up plan B, and plan B uh, is, is the church. Well, I, you can imagine I reject that uh, for probably a number of reasons, but but primarily because if you accept that, you have to accept the idea that Jesus failed. He failed in what he intended to do when he came. And folks, I don't care what you say. I don't think Jesus failed at anything. So I just think that is a misguided uh, view uh, of the church. But if you accept that view, then obviously you're not going to see the church in the Old Testament because the church wasn't even a thought of God in the Old Testament. It became a stopgap measure as a result of problems in the, in the New Testament. But if you believe, as I do, that the church is just a continuation of God's people, then you're not surprised at all to see things in the Old Testament that remind you of things in, uh, uh, concerning, concerning the church. And you find language 
in the New Testament with regard to the church that reminds you of the same language in the Old Testament uh, used of Israel. For instance, Peter said, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's talking about the church. And notice how he describes this. Uh, A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession. Those things sound familiar? Well, if you've read uh, much of the Old Testament, especially if you've read from the book of Exodus, they do. In Exodus, God says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We see some, the same words, don't we? My own possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Used both of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament. I made this chart uh, it takes those two scriptures and the church described by Peter, the, the words are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for God's own possession. And the Exodus passage, uh, the kingdom of priests, a holy nation, and my own uh, possession. So I believe that you do see the church um, in, uh, in the Old Testament and you see it as as it looks forward to what's going to happen uh, uh, when, when the church actually begins, that we'll look at in just a minute. So what about the, the, the New Testament, church in the New Testament? Well, it was anticipated for sure. John the Baptist was said to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He was to prepare the way for what the Messiah uh, was going to, was, was going to, to do. And his message had to do with the kingdom. He said, repent, steen. When Jesus, responding to Peter's confession as to who Jesus is, says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So I... I believe the church was expected. It wasn't something that was just thought up to to fill a gap. Secondly, the the beginning of the church is identifiable. The day is identifiable. It began on what is called the day of day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was one of the uh, Jewish feasts. Uh, it came 50 days after the uh, Passover Sabbath. So Pentecost would always begin on the first day of the week, um, which would be what what we call Sunday. So it's been 50 days since Jesus rose uh, from the dead. Why Pentecost? Well, it seems to me that Pentecost was a perfect day to begin the church. Um, Pentecost would provide worldwide exposure uh, for the church. Um, During Passover... People came from all over the world to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And oftentimes they would stay over and just, you know, 50 days later, they'd spent a lot of money, a lot of time coming, might as well celebrate two feast days. So they would hang hang around for 50 days. And so on Pentecost, there would be nearly as many people in Jerusalem as there would be for Passover. And those people would represent countries from all over uh, the world. Um, If you want to read about some of those countries, uh, you can look in Acts chapter 2. I don't remember the exact verses. It's not very far into chapter 2. And it gives a list of where people were from. And so when those people who heard the gospel and accepted the gospel became followers of Jesus, went home, what, what did they take with them? They took with them the gospel. 
And so Pentecost was a great time to uh, roll out the church because it would, it would be represented throughout all of the world. Now, I want to say this. This is my belief. Pentecost was not the beginning of the creation of the people of God. The people of God existed prior to Pentecost. God's people were the Jews. They were, they were chosen, in, and we see that in the Old Testament. So what's Pentecost? Pentecost marked the expansion of the people of God. Now, all people could become people of God, not just, not just Jews. Gentiles, that's you and me for the most part. And we, we see that in, in Scripture mentioned several times. Uh, Peter said, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And Paul, in the second chapter of Ephesians, just a great chapter where he talks about this. And he says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's kind of depressing when you see how Paul describes this. And isn't it? Let's go back and look. Therefore, uh, he describes this, that says that we were separate from Christ, that we were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, that we were strangers to the covenants of promise, that we had no hope, that we were without God in this world, and we were considered to be far away from God. Now, other than that, we're in great shape. But that's us. That was us before the redemptive work of Jesus, and that is us before we were included uh, in, into the body of Christ and the people as among the people of God. Later on in that chapter, Paul says this, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away. Who's that? That's the Gentiles. That's us. And peace to those who were near. Who's that? That's Israel. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. See, my conviction is God doesn't have two peoples. He has, he has one per people. And that now includes us Gentiles and, uh, in, in, in the church. And so we are privileged now to be joined with the, the original people of God, the Jews, to become the people of God. And that is all because um, of the redemptive work of Jesus. Pentecost marks the culmination of years of preparation to, in order to be able for God to offer universal redemption so it was it happened on an identifiable day it um, it contained identifiable events such as uh, the apo the apostles were empowered Jesus had promised the apostles that they would be empowered Jesus said I'm said to the apostles I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That was said right before Jesus uh, ascended back into heaven. 
And also in the, in, at the time of the ascension, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the, of the earth. So on this day, one of the things that was going to happen was that the apostles were going to be empowered. Uh, did that happen? Well, yes, it did happen. It happened on the day of Pentecost. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. Here's part of it. And suddenly, the, the apostles are gathered together. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterances. So what had been promised to the apostles was fulfilled to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. What else happened? Well, the gospel was preached. And we don't have time to look at it, but if you will read the second chapter of Acts, you will find recorded in the second chapter of Acts the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Now, I think it's important to understand that Peter probably was not the only one preaching. It's not that Peter is up here preaching and the other 11 apostles are standing around taking notes uh, in the background. No, I, I think they all were empowered. They all have the same message. So I've, I believe that they spread out throughout the entire city of Jerusalem and they began to share uh, the gospel and, and because of the empowerment, here's the great thing that goes back to the fact that these people are from all over the world. Because of the empowerment, everyone heard the gospel in their own language. There wouldn't be any mistake. They would hear it in their own language. And the third thing is that souls were added it says in Acts 2.41, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. To the, there's probably about 120 believers or followers of Jesus uh, before they began preaching. And when they're done preaching, there are uh, 3,000. And 3,120 the third thing is that the beginning of the church was methodical. Um, the, the methodical activity of the church is also recorded in Acts chapter 2. The first 41 verses of Acts chapter 2 tells about what happened on the day of Pentecost. But when you get to verse 42 to the end of the chapter, you're going to have descriptions of things the church did. Some of them they probably did on that day, but the, the idea here is that they, things that they continued to do after the, the day of Pentecost. So as, as a congregation, we're told in Acts 2.42 that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They... Luke decides to identify those four things. They must have had some relative significance to the activity of the, of the church. The apostles' doctrine, that's, that's the teaching. That was a result of the empowerment. They were going to, they, Jesus told them, because you're going to be empowered, whenever you speak, you're going to speak the truth. And so... When, when they stood up and preached the gospel, they were speaking the truth. When they taught the church after the day of Pentecost, they were speaking the truth. Now, we still have that. We still have that because we have the New Testament. And that is, that is a record of the apostles' doctrine. So we still have what they did. 
Uh, the second thing was fellowship. We'll talk about this more later, but this is sharing lives with one another. It is an important uh, aspect of the New Testament church. Then it says breaking of bread. There's two ways that the, that phrase is used in uh, the New Testament. Sometimes it refers to just eating a meal together. Sometimes it refers to uh, uh, taking the Lord's Supper, taking communion. And you, you kind of have to look at the context and see which one you think is best represented uh, in, my, in my judgment, the breaking of bread in this context, the activity of the church seemingly at worship or in gathering, seems to probably mean uh, they were sharing in the, the Lord's Supper. And then prayer. Prayer was a foundational aspect of all that the church did. So that's why they did as a group. But then also we're told about their generosity. And those who had uh, believed were together and had all things common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, I got to admit to you, I don't know that I've ever sold possessions in order to give to someone in need. Maybe I should. Maybe that's just one of the blessings we're missing because we don't do that. Why would they do that? Well, listen, they, they were people under persecution. What happened when, when uh, Romans came and said, uh, hey, hey, you can't be a Christian? Oftentimes, everything they had was taken. Their homes were taken. Their possessions were taken. So why not give them to somebody else before the Romans get them? I think that's a very legitimate thing to think. They, they, they saw that they didn't own anything anymore because they were followers of Jesus. And so they shared with anyone who had need. And then we see the oneness, the unity. Uh, day by day. They continued with one mind in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. They, were in, they, they had one mind. They were united. They, they fellowshiped. And then we get a picture of what that was. They went from house to house, uh, having meals together. I think in this context, the breaking of bread uh, most likely refers to eating a, a meal together. And they were praising God. And they were enjoying favor with, with all the people. So we see the methodical activity of the church, but we also see the methodical growth of the church. Uh, it says in, that kind of ends this chapter, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Listen, if, if you don't hear me say anything else, hear me say this, that it is the Lord who adds to his church. No council, no board, no priest, no pope, no minister, no elder can add one person to the church. It is God who adds uh, to the church. No one can put your name in the Lamb's book of life. I love that story last week that I told where the, the Hmong people sent... 10,000 signatures. They didn't know what the Lamb's Book of Life, but they asked John Lee to, to see that those names got in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, John Lee couldn't do that, but God did that. And so it is God who adds to the church. Well, we'll talk about that at, at another time. So what I want to leave you with, two things. First of all, the church is a divine plan. It is not an afterthought. I, I believe the church has been the plan of God since the promise of redemption was made to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That the church was in God's mind. And the church isn't something created because Jesus failed when he came the first time. 
if you are a part of God's church, you are a part of God's eternal divine plan of redemption. Isn't that great? You are a part of God's eternal design. And the second thing is that the church will not be overcome. And in, 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 in spite of how dark sometimes things look, we know that the church will never be overcome. That's, that's what Jesus said when he, when he responded to Peter's confession in Matthew chapter 16. He said, I say, also, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, look, the church consists of all of God's people. But the church presently exists in Satan's domain. Now, we need to keep that in in mind. We, we, We exist in the domain of what is called or who is called the God of this world. So how do you think Satan likes the church? Well, he doesn't like the church. He hates the church. And, and by the way, Satan hates you as well. Don't be, don't be fooled. He hates you and would like to see nothing better than to drag you to eternal damnation with him. He hates you. It's amazing that we uh, are so lightly consider him sometimes. But look, because we are in Satan's realm, until Jesus comes back again and destroys Satan and evil forever, ever, Satan will continue to attack the church. There's a man that lived during the uh, Second World War named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, you've probably heard of him. He was a, a, a minister and a theologian uh, he was executed under Hitler's uh, Nazis. He gave his, gave his life. And one of the things he talked about on several occasions or wrote about was the cost of discipleship, the cost of being a disciple. For Bonhoeffer, it, it cost him his life. Personally, I, I look at the world and I think there's no way that we are not headed for an opportunity for Satan to up his, up his game. It, it's open now. We, we live in a time that at least for a while, uh, evil will be declared to be good, and what is good will be said to be evil. I believe we're living in a time that at least for a while, your religious liberty is greatly in jeopardy. And it may cost us more to be a disciple right now. But I finish with this. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Because remember Jesus' promise that the gates of hell, Satan's hell, will not overpower the church, nor does he have to overpower you. The, the scripture we talk about all the time, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for um, the redemptive work of Jesus, which has now included us all into your people. And we thank you, Father, for the hope and the promises that are ours and Father, I just pray that you would give us courage and sustain us in, in days ahead where, where, where it does appear that evil is overcoming. Help us to always remember that Satan will never overcome the church. Help us always to remember, greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matt, for that message of truth. That's one thing you can be assured of.
in this church is every week you're going to have a message from the truth, from the Word of God. It's one of the things I love about this church. We're going to stand now and sing about the church, Jesus Messiah, who is the church.
we have a um, an event around here um, three or four times a year. We call it Next Steps. And what that is, it's uh, we meet on Saturday morning at 9, goes till lunch. We, we provide lunch. And we... It, it's to learn about new life. And so it's a good time for questions. And we try to answer all the questions. We give you a little bit of uh, background as to, you know, where we started and how we started. Um, and and describe some of the things that go on here. It's, it's an information. Uh, if it's an information time. Doesn't cost anything. And we are going to have the next one on uh, February 27th. That's the last Saturday uh, in in February. So um, I think uh, uh, David said that we had about 15 people have signed up for that. Now, we were going to do it earlier, but we had to cancel it. At that time, we had about 40 people signed up, but we're not sure... We're not, let me just ask you this. If you had signed up before, would you just go by the table and tell them that you had, and then they'll get your name and information from the previous list. But we just need to know who who to expect. And, uh, hey, it's, it's worth coming for the lunch alone. I mean, uh, you should be able to tolerate uh, anything to get the great lunch that we have. So consider it on uh, February 27th at 9 o'clock. It's called Next Steps. Um, also, uh, just one more thing. Um, Jean Fife's daughter is named Sharon. She married a guy by the name of Chris Hughes. They've been here uh, quite often. Well, Chris' his dad uh, is with them. They're down here now, and Chris's dad is with them. And he turns 100 on Tuesday. So um, I'm just telling you that because they're coming to second service. That's the plan. So when you leave, if you see Gene, uh, you'll probably be able to pick out uh, the Chris's dad. His name is Ron, and, um, and you might want to wish him a happy birthday. So uh, that's great. He... They live in Ohio, and he wanted to play golf on his 100th birthday. So, um, so his son decided probably Florida would be a better place to play <laughs> golf than uh, Ohio. And so they're down here so that he can do that. And you might as well, it wouldn't do any good to look for birthday candles at Walmart because uh, I think uh, Ron's got them all bought up for his birthday cake on, on Tuesday. So if you've seen them, uh, wish him a happy birthday. Okay, I'm done. All right. Let us pray. Stand and we'll be dismissed. Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all, thank you for being here with us today, O Lord. We come together as your body to sing praises to your name and hear truth from your word. Lord, and we've done that today. Hope it was pleasing in your sight. Be with us as we leave this place, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so those that see us may see you. In Christ's precious name, amen. Have a great week.